Line. In case I do lose my own marbles, I won't have to worry about accidentally trumpling them in the process. Just in case. Hello, it's me, Susan. Today is going to be an interesting day, I will admit, because um, I'm going to be taking on another Comic Snakes challenge. Normally the fanfic critic would do this herself, but I don't want her to do it. Seeing the last couple times she did this, she didn't have a pleasant reaction. And I'm getting sick and tired of this Ringmaster J5 torturing my friend. No matter. Let's get this over with. It appears that the first fanfic I'll be taking a look at is a Dragon Ball Z fanfic known as The Last Battle of Vegeta and Goku by Comics Nix. Let's not waste any more time and let's get this over with. The story is rated M. It's in English. It's Aang's tragedy. It's Goku and Vegeta and has seven reviews. The Last Battle of Vegeta and Goku The Author Hi people, my first anime slash manga fic. I don't own Dragon Ball franchise. He spelled franchise wrong, but it rocks. I love Goku and Vegeta pair, so here we are now. A big love story of the two. Enjoy. Goku is fighting with Vegeta, they spell Vegeta's name wrong, they have two T's in there instead of just the one, for the Dragon Balls because Vergta turned evil and wanted to take over the world. Going back to say six ball Goku, I'm invincible. Okay, there's already a problem with this story. For those who are familiar with Dragon Ball Z, Vegeta never calls Goku by his earth name. He calls him by his Saiyan name, Kakarot. So clearly this person isn't as big of a fan of Dragon Ball as he's trying to claim. But no way, Vegeta. You will not have him. Vegeta was angry because Goku had six balls and he only had one. But he was going to take back. So he started to charge, change, change, I guess, charge, I believe, his superpower and eject a Kamehameha from his palms. Vroom! Goku, trying to, ju trying to dodge, let one ball fall and got distracted. So the Kamehameha picked up one of his eyes obliterating it in an explosion of blood, veins, and pain. Ah, my eye, my one eye, cried in pain gawk. Ha ha ha, now I have two dragon balls, shouted happy Vegeta. Vegeta flied to the ground and picked up the ball. He was happy and got immediately erect with passion and lust. Goku's eye was on the ground and Vegeta picked it and started to rub and feel it. He was very liking because Goku's eye was sensual, so he fly back to where Goku was in the heaven. If you don't let my you other Dragon Balls um, kill you other eye, never, I won't do that even if I lose my dick. Goku was courageous and protected the balls with his life. He will not let Vegeta rule the world. 
The blood was flowing through the left empty eye socket, and it was black. Vegeta launched a contaminated Kamehameha, contaminated with his evil and wantonness. The blood turned a almost black red and started to boil. Ah, my brain is boiling cried Goku in pain because his infected blood was reacting on his body. View Jita took Goku's carelessness and fried him fried to him and started to punch his belly with a with a thousand punches. Goku vomited his stomach that fell on the ground and splashed. At that moment Goku knew he was going to die, so to not let Vegeta use the Dragon Ball's power he let his rage out. His penis got large because it was full of infected blood boiling and it started to escape through his penis pores. He was hurting but got went rage and started to spank Vegeta with all of his power. Ah, you are killing me, cried Vegeta, who knew Goku got the upper hand. His greatest error was the evil Kamehameha because it turned Goku evil. So Goku was killing him because he turned evil now. Well, I think that was explanatory. Goku punched with so strong hands, Vegeta's spinal cord ripped his back and went a thousand kilometers flying in the atmosphere. He had no back now, but managed to fly because of his powers. His flesh got grounded and... Millions of pieces of his now dead and rotten flesh fly in all directions. Now you will see, said Goku, who put his hand on Vegeta's dick and started to shred it. Pulsation veins fall on the ground, screaming and moaning. So Goku picked Vegeta's bladder and put it out with so violence it went out of his bowels and stomach too. Now Vegeta is a dead casket of a man, only soothing because he is strong. But now Vegeta turned good again because Majin Buu's control van vanished because he was suffering and Majin Buu don't like suffer. Goku, sorry. Goku knew Vegeta was good again and hugged him. He was feeling sorry because he never revealed his feelings to Vegeta. Vegeta, I have something to say. I love you. Vegeta's eyes opened a lot, and he liked, because he wanted to say the same thing. I love you too, Goku. The two started making out. They were very gentle with one another. Vegeta had no penis. So Goku went to his back and started to put his man member on Vegeta. Vegeta was liking because he groaned and moaned like a cat. Goku put his hands on Vegeta's torax and rubbed and stroked it with passion and lust. Vegeta liked. So the time came and Goku was ready to let out his pleasure juice. He held the much time he could to be pleasure be big and then he let it out, a big splash of happiness and joy, but sadly it spilled out of Vegeta's body because he had no front so the calm could not rest on his colon. The two hugged stronger and then they started to fall to the ground. They were dead. The end. That was interesting this next fic was meant for the ffc but her unfortunate condition at the moment means that you will have to do it well that was delightful next fanfic oh yes i think i know why comic sneaks or what no, i'm sorry ringmaster j5 wanted the fanfic critic to read this because it has something to do with Halo and she's a big fan of that game. Well, at least he won't have the pleasure of seeing her suffer. Trust me, dearie, you'll thank me for knocking you out later. So, the fanfic I'm taking a look at next is called Halo Time Paradox by Comic Snix. It's rated M, it's English, sci fi drama, Master Chief John 117, four reviews. Let's get this over with. The author. Hello people again, Halo is not mine nor Master Chief. This time I went with something different. I can't tell what it is because of spoilers, but I hope you like it. Halo, Time Paradox, Part 1, The Invasion. I, apostrophe T-S, the 26th century. 
The Covenant are destroying the human bases and only Master Chief can save the galaxy. At this point, Master Chief is invading a Covenant ship. He exploded the door with a big gun. Cockron! Master Chief was leading a big soldier's squadron and they had a very good weapon. They were swatting. Master, the Covenant are getting through the hall we opened. Cry, soldier. Don't pain my fellow Sudia. We will be victory, attested Master Chief. The started to shoot the Covenant. And... What? They started to shoot the Covenant. And big green splashed of blood started to spill from their bullet holes. Okay. Master moved and them kicked a covenant in the face, exposing inner organs and blood and veins. Die, you alien slug. Big metallic monster appeared above the ship. It's the counter-attack, shouted Master. The Arctum... Metallic, what? It, okay, they spelled that weird. Monsters were in the number of three and started to grab fellow soldiers, sucking them in and making chopping meat from them. Because in their anal passage, the Araco metallic monster had saws and sharp blades to cut limbs from soldiers. Master looked and had an eye dead. Shoot to the anus, because the anus is the power source where it cuts soldiers and transformed them into energy. The soldiers started to shoot and lots of blood and carnage fell from the bullet holes. He, Araka Metallic Monster, were animals too because they were bleeding. Covenant turned them into assassinic monsters to destroy humans. A moment later they exploded with a big bang. The soldiers liked very much Master Chief because he was big and much stronger than then. He had a very cool helmet. Soldiers! Enter the ship. The soldiers entered, shooting everywhere, opening holes in the ship hull, and let vacuum enter the ship. Luckily, the soldiers had oxygen mask masks. Master Chief kicked and punched a lot of covenants, exploding their skulls with his powerful blows, but one evil fiend was planning Master Chief to part. It was uh, the Covenant ship leader. He was at his room and was ta talking with his daughter, a good fighter and a real beautiful lady. My daughter, do you understand our plan to destroy the Master Chief? Asked the father. Yes, father. I will destroy Master Chief the way we planned. The Covenant daughter prepared the trap to Master Chief. It was a big portal the Covenant found in an abandoned planet. They didn't know what it was, but it was big and looked dangerous. That would kill Master Chief! Master was moving with his soldiers in the ship, approaching the ship's bridge to capture the ship's command. Master Chief cried to his soldiers, Move on! You are destroying this crap of ship that are much stronger than alien tramps. Right. The soldiers were motivated and started to hug themselves to transmit the soldier way of fight life. In the command room, the daughter prepared the machine. Master Chief was approaching the room. Master them blew the heel of the door and charged in. Charge, cried the strong chief warrior. The daughter said, ah, right where I wanted, and activated the shive. A big vortex started to appear in their room and started to suck everyone in. What is this? A man trap? Ma shouted Master Chide to the daughter. She was confused because she did not blast she did not blast her masters in her organs as her foot had said. Arthur, you said you knew how I worked. But father was laughing because he really knew. He wanted his daughter out of the way. She was just too much fair with the enemy, but he was cruel and didn't want the fair hair to his cruel army. So he tricked her. Ha ha ga 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 ga, farewell my child and you too chief. Master and the daughter got sucked in the vortex inside it. Part two, the problem. Master and daughter were swirling inside the strange thing in them. After 
of what looked like many hours they got erected from it. Splish! And the two fell down on the ground. Faster than lightning, the daughter picked her rifle and pointed Master head. Don't move, she cried. Master got immovable. He was half cocked because she was faster than him. But nonetheless, the master stayed calm. Calm down, I will not hurt, said Master Chief. He was clever. He heard the father cheating his daughter. I will kill you, Master. You decimate my people. Master needs to be clever, because she almost shoots him. Actually, it's not my fault. She shoot the ground with great rage. Shut up. I swear you killing everyone. No. I only got orders. And the war started because of your father. See, so shots the heaven and got much angrier than before. Shut up! She was very nervous. And this was the change of Master Chief. He jumped at her, grabbed her gun with big dexterity, and fell above her on the ground. Ah! Cat me go! No, it wasn't listening your father saying he wanted to kill you. No, he was nervous. No, he wanted to kill you. He was grabbing her shoulder very hard to note, let her go, but she was calming. Ah, this can't be. Will you try to shoot me? Will you try to shot moi? No. Okay. She got up and was confused. What do now? Master said, them said, let us find a way out of here. They started Rue move together and watched the landscape. It was beautiful had wolves and plants and scrubs and mires. They haven't seen this much grass in too much time because they were fighting for so long. Then they saw something strange. It was a castle, a very big castle, full of flags, red wolves, and a pit bull of water and alligators. What places? Master then put his uh, helm helmet off because it were hot. The governing girl looked and liked. She thought, oh, he is beautiful. But Master couldn't listen. They moved to a town searching for clues. The people were scared and started to go away. A young stranger soldier with swords went to them. Behold, you witched. Ye are not accepted in this land of ye. The language was strange, very old. Master spook. Don't panic, boy. We are searching for a way home. The soldiers then saw the daughter beside Master Chief. Ah, a daemon. She were blue. So the five soldiers unsheathed their swords and attacked the daughter. She jumped ten feet in the air and punched two of them in their spinal cords, exploding their internal heart and making them cramped. Ah, I paraplegic. What on earth does that mean? Is that even a word? Probably not, so let's continue. Cry the soldier. The other two soldiers charged to Master Chief, but Master was faster and picked his big rifle and pointed to their head, where he shoot big balls of lightning fury got out of the barrel gun and sent two soldier head, exploding them in a thousand pieces across the air, leading to a rain of blood and ribs falling on the ground. The last soldier scared and run. Now they will bring reinforcers, said Master. They are puny, don't know how to fight, and are weak. Even a thousand of them can't destroy us, said, Do said Alter. Part 3. The Mystery Man Has this man not heard of something called chapters? Whatever. In the shadow, a dark figure was looking the action on the street. He was the top roof, only looking, analyzing the two warriors. He then went to the nearby forest, where his group of rebels were hiding. This was a clergyman between them, the two hooded man talked to. You know, I saw something that can help us. Yes, what it was, my dear friend. Two warriors being attacked by the soldiers came. They were very able to fight, mangling the gods with their bare hands. You know I don't like violence. Yes, and I know you have to say that, but you know what must be done. If it is in your heart, 
my lord, so shall be. The hooded man then went out and went searching for the two. It was not hard, because confusion was at ease. Burn the witches! Burn the till them die in hell's flesh. Ah, my back, the witches enchanted mine. The crowd was angry, and a mob formed to lynch master and daughter. The hooded looked. Mister, I'm weak against fire, I will die, said the daughter, but master was protection head. The mob advanced and encircled the two, and started to throw a rock. But in a microsecond, the hooded man jumped in, throwing a lot of gold coins in the air. Money! It's a miracle! Shouted a crowd man. The mob forgot master and daughter and went to the monies. You are very uncon unconscious for strong fighters, said the hooded. Look at this brute. Wick the, the size and it's impossible not to call attention, sad daughter. You're blue, said Master. Calm down, you two. Hey, who are you after all? asked Chief. No time to talk. Let's get back to my headquarters. They runned very fast between the shadows and the rooftop, passing every soldier they could find. The hood man was very knowledgeable of the city of the city in her meanings, knowing every fighting hole inside it out. But them, big grunts with long swords, mastered them, picked his rifle and shoot their heads, terminating their pitiful lives. They then reached the forest headquarters. A, a lot of people were waiting. Even a big guy who opened his arms and hailed when the hooded man and master and daughter arrived. Robin Hood, your back, and with friends. Little John, my dear fellow friend, I'm here. Part 4. The Plan Robin Hood was lecturing master and daughter on the problem. This is why we need your power to overcome the evil ruler. The daughter was not liking. She wanted revenge, not help dung-covered townspeople. Master then said, well, we don't know how to go away. It's not a big deal if we help these people. Well, actually, I can think we can send you back to your time, friend, said Robin. Oh, yes, said Master. Yes, the castle have a powerful magician that serves the king. We never saw him. It seems he, he makes powerful spells to his king. We can kidnap him. We, we finish the king and you go back to your land, said the faithful Robin. So be it, said the daughter, unhappy. Master and daughter weapons got discharged when they shoot so many soldiers back in the city. City, I'm sorry. But Robin got a plan. To yes, Master Chief, a big claymore. And he lent the big sword to Master. I knew Master Chief's girl friend dead. A big bow and archer to shoot people in the eyes like me. And Robin lent the bow and archer to the daughter. Why I keep the crap weapon? asked her. You have the finest of a lady of all, a lady of very distant lands, clamoring the kingdom of your people. And then Robin picked her hand and kissed it. She blushed, turning violent, violet to cover. Well, I should say violet, but it says violent. But Master hadn't liked it. He was starting to cultivate eelings for her. So he's cultivating eels for her? I'm sorry. Let's continue. She was beautiful and strong. To be a perfect woman to him, he thought. So let's move and destroy the king, cried Master Chief as he put his helmet on. Every one of the rebels accompanied and were happy. They will get black the land of themselves. Part 5. The Invasion The rebels, led by Robin Hoods, went in stealthily inside the town. They approached the enemy gates. Master and daughter were with them. Talking very silently, Robin said to his fellow soldiers, Okay, now we storm the castle and kill the king! Cried Robin as he kicked the front door. All rebels entered the castle and started to evacuate the guards inside. 
balls and stood flung away at the castle wall, painting the wall in the ground red with blood of fallen heroes. Master was cutting soldiers and daughter drilling them in the eyes with a bow. Carnage and sweating contaminated the air. The war has begun. Master and daughter, accompany me in the stairs. We must kill the Nottingham Sheriff. They went up the stairs. The sheriff was witting a big blaster gun, the kind that shoot shots lasers. It had three cannons of repeated fire mode. Ah, Ronib Hooden, I was expecting you, said the sheriff as he shot the lasers to Robin. In a nanosigsind, Ronib deflected the razor with his magic sword, destroying the roof. How can he have a laser gun? asked Master to Robin. It's the magic of Merlin. He makes these weapons to the high officers. Sheriff shoots another ball of energy and this time it picked the daughter's shoulder arm. No! cried a unhappy Master with what has happened. He went to daughter in, hu in huge tear. Don't hide, said Master. I will not. It's a mild hurt, said daughter. Then they looked in the eye of, in, of another and knew. But Sheriff was very angry and don't let that continue. Now you will die. Ronin, with his fast legs, went to Sheriff and jumped ten feet in the air and landed on Sheriff's head with his boot, shifting his neck and exploding his brains with suck a strong blow from his feet. Arg! cried Sheriff of Nottingham as he fell to his down from the widow behind him. Master and daughter got up and went with Robin to the King Chamber to the final confrontation. Part 6, the final battle. Robin and Master and daughter went up and reached the King's room he was expecting. Ah, you finally came. Come in and join me in a banquet said the king. King Arthur, you think you, you escape his time, said Ronib. Oh, mm, don't be desperate. Let's eat, said King Arthur. Master, daughter, and Robin seated on the dining table. It was full of good food, shrimps, lobsters, and octopuses, very fresh, Take from the sea, they ate it and got full. So, Robin, why you want to kill me? asked Kin Arthur. You steal the money from our people, as said Robin. But I invest the money in schools and education. Yes, but only for your family. Yeah, that's the point. Then the king got up from his dining chair and said, Time, tie, die, Robin. King Arthur took a flaming whip from under the table and slashed it in Robin apostrophe R direction. The daughter went very fast and put Rabuin from harm's way. Damn, cried Arthur. The daughter then jumped to Arthur and stopped to punch him, but Arthur was fast and threw its whip on the chandelier, chandelier and flew all over the room. Come here, you coward, cried daughter. Arthur then whipped from the chandelier everyone and hurt everyone, but Master picked his claymore and slashed Arthur whip with a big blow. Ah, my whip! And Arthur ran to secret chamber behind his throne and looked himself in. Get out, Arthur, to face you dead, cried Robin. But them... The door opened, and Romit, a big, mean, six feet tall, exosquilton, with Arthur inside, emerged from the chamber. The exo- oh, I see, it's supposed to be an exoskeleton, but they spelled it completely wrong. Had six arms with laser and swords, swinging menacingly towards Master and his crew. Look out, Master, he is deadly- Enemy now, shouted daughter. The exo Arthur moved towards them and started to shot laser 
Aha, 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 ah. He laughed maniacally. You call that evil laughter, honestly. Robin Dion did knew what to do. He never confronted such a big monster in his life. He was not prepared to face the future. Boyd, master and daughter had experience, so they engineered a plan. Daughter jumped behind the monster and started to kick it in the ass. Arthur felt the uh, pain because the exoskeletor was hardwired on his brain. Nasta then kicked him with all of his fur in the groin, making Arthur's face go purple. It was very hurtful, but Arthur didn't give hope away and went to attack them, swing his sword and shooting the lasers in every direction. The roof of the castle was crumbling and falling, and the heroes had to put themselves apart to not get a rock on head. The castle started. Okay. To shake with so much bruises. Ma sister and daughter then charred in the exo author direction and master with claymore and daughter with the blow punctured Arthur's skull with the final lethal blow, making a hole in his front nose and to his neck, spewing Arthur brains all over England. Robin thus said, Quickly, master and daughter, the Merlin is inside the chamber. He can take you back to your land. The three went to the secret chamber, but in who Merlin... They only saw a strange, secular device. It was Covenant technology. All the time there was now Merlin, only future tech. They then activated the portal before the castle crumbled in ruins, and them did farewell to Robin. Thanks, Robin. Without Eoy, we can't back home, said Master. The Yanks too, Robin. You're a gentleman, said Daughter. Farewell, my friends, now. When you want to go back, you can stay in my castle, said Robin. And now, King of England. Master and daughter enter the machine. Part 7, the final battle. Wait, wasn't the other part called the final battle? Yes, it was. So, yes, how creative of you. You're so lazy, you couldn't have used a different title for that. You're also lazy, you couldn't have broken this all up into actual chapters. Instead, you have to be one big, massive story, pretty much. Whatever, let's continue. Then the vortex opened inside Covenant ships, sucking out Master and Alter. Daughter's father then said, Eo alive, this cannot be. You can count on this pal, said Master. Time to die, my father, cried Daughter. With her bow in hand, and she lost thou launched thousands of arrows on his father's body, ever, ever scrating his internal organs and filling the air with blood from his corpse, he was finished and only could say, sorry, my daughter, I love you, and he's dead. Well, you couldn't have loved her that much if you were willing to kill her because you didn't want her to rule. The battle is over. Master Chief ordered his soldiers to annually rape all the Covenant lefty alive so they be human slaves. The soldiers like because they very much long for their homes and their wives. Now they can satisfy, satisfy their sexual appetites. So now, what will it be, daughter? said asked Master. Shut up, cried out loud daughter as she picked Master Chief checks and started toy kissing passionately, he retributed with a lot bigger kiss and they were happy. Epilogue. Now, after three years, Master Chief and daughter are a happy couple married with two children and with a small house near England where rests the corpse of his friend's Robin. 
They built a big memorial to him so no one would forget the great king he was. That was strange. The next fic is, well, it's a crossover fic that involves Naruto, Sasuke, Slash, Hulk clones, and cum cheese. Very hard to explain. Well, let's get this over with the next story. Yes. Well, Naruto, Naruto, whatever you pronounce it. Let's take a look at it. Farm faking question is called Training in the Village for a Massive Man. Comics Nix is the author. Why do we even bother saying this? You know what? Let's just skip the the formalities and just read the bloody story. The author. Hi, people. I did this story very fast. The week passed very fast and I had no time to th nick much about a history. It's a bit hasty made. Sorry for that, but I decided to just not let the date pass because I promise it a story every Friday. Even though it's not that polished, I hope you enjoy. What are you talking about? None of your stories are polished. I promise it the next one will be more careful. Enjoy. Training in the village for a massive man. Bruce Banner arrived at the Leaf Village. He wants to be a ninja, so he can con no troll emotion to not let Hulk smash everyone's lives and dreams and loves. So he goes to the Hulk Age. And um, please forgive me if I say the Japanese names wrong. I'm not familiar with Japanese literature, Japanese names really. The fanfic critic is probably more of an expert at that, but even she doesn't pronounce it all right at the time, so um, please forgive me if I say it wrong. The Greater Master Ninja of the Lever, Mr. Hokage Saibana. I eat train. I must control eternal fertile that kills my chances to obtain a life of pleasurable love alongside woman's bosom and nails. Oh. You say you want to train, don't you, Mr. Boner? No. We don't train non-Japanese. We train Japanese, so fuck off, you bastard. Bruce Boner got very mad. Got very angry mad at Hulk Ho Jake. And the Hulk Upras were surfacing, wanting to kill an old pillow of shit and ninja carnissary. Hicks's eyes got red and mouth got purple and Hulk was ready to roll, but then Hulk Age screamed a girly girl voice. I'm sorry, they're meant to be girly girl, but whatever. Screamed a girly girl voice entering the sack where Bruce and Hulk Age was. It's Naruto, the powerful orange ninja, and was along Sasuke, the goth village idiot. They gave hands to another. So love be forever among them, and never let a woman interfere with their most brotherhoodly love. Sasuke kissed Naruto's ear. Ah, relax Naruto, what a man. Bruce Banner suddenly feel Hulk go away. What? He wanted to kill. But that boy, what was about him? He felt like a big feral beast lies inside the small Japanese body of the orange flower of the east. Bruce Banner thought. My great china wall collapsed. And blood pumped inside his tomato dick. What? Hockage noted what happened so he said to Banner. Bonner, I let you stay in train. You will turn Japanese. I don't think it works like that. But Hokage had other plans for banners. Naruto take Bruce to his tent. He will well, train with us and be nin be big ninja to kill inner fears and preserve intimacy besides other unaccomplished behaviors. Master, said Naruto, confused by the so impressive powerful words emerging by Hokage Hockick's mouth. Grr, take Banner to your home. We will train him to Mario Row. Naruto and Sasuke did as Hockage said. That night, 
Bruce Vinana was really happy. He was around a bonfire with Sosuke and Naruto to his side. However, women was approaching. Good Lord, Naruto, it's Sakura, cried Sasuke, and he shed a tear of crushed pride. He effeminated body started to shake as Sakura feminine present arrives because real men stay with man. Hello! cried out Sa Sasuka with big boobies emerging from her chest. She got a boob job today so she want to show to Sasuke for whom she has a crush. Sasuke, do you want do you see anything different in my body, my chest, my nipples? And Sakura immediately punched Sasuke with her immense breasts. What? Sasuke vomited. Blech! Sakura's chest got all covered with possessed ramen because so Sasuke has the devil in his body. Oh man! Oh God! Oh man, repeated um, in Fintam Sakure, horrified by the little devil's dwelling inside the ramen vomit. Sasuke, the devil want to crush my heart, cried again Sakura, but she was wrong. They don't want a heratha, they want a breast implants. The blue small horny devils. With they drill shaped penises make holes into Sakura breasts, perforating then and exposing the raw flesh of that once was hot girl. They found the silicone and ate it till nobody silicone could find itself. Sakura looked in awe and shark her now saggy titties reaching the ground and bleeding like castrated murky llama. Sasuke, look what he did to me. I'm ruined. And Sakura ran away, going back to her tent with her flabby, scarred for life, fucked up breasts. Zero. What's with the zero? What, what am I talking about? This is comics mix. Ah ha 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 ha. Finally, Sakura got what she deserves, laughed out loud, Sasuke with Naruto clapping his hands in approval of such bad acts. But Bruce Banner, he didn't like it. Why such boys act in such a way to pierce the sentiments of women like that? Even thought the resolent kiss between Naruto and Sasuke gave him a Banner. Banner cried silently, mourning for those big, beautiful, slotted pairs of fine Japanese milk fountain volleyballs. So, everyone went to sleep and dreamed of angles. Angles. There's the obtuse angle, the right angle, and the acute angle. No, that's what they were dreaming about. I think they meant to say angels. Whatever, let's continue. The next day, Bruce Branner, or Banner training. Naruto was the chief of training. So he trained Bryce Barnum with all the girlish attitude is possible from an orange ninja boy. Sakuka trained Banner in jitsus, ninjutsus, and every kicks and fists he could teach to a green heart filled scientist. Bruce was progressing. Bruce Banner said Hokage. You learn well. In no time, Will Will turn to Japanese and Hulk hugged Bruce, squeezing Bruce's buttocks because Hulk Age wanted to see Bruce flex all of his muscles and show how of a virile man he was. Because of scientific method, Bruce used his mental capacities to learn my Thigh, he had a most difficult and hard training fighting style in the world. His ankles, knees, knees I mean, and elbows got rigid and big, unhappy with such much abuse in the joints. Banner acquired cancer in the jowls.
Oh God, said Nariot, crying tears of pornographic graphically and shaking his wrists like bulls' penises. Banner will die, Sosuke. What shall we do? I don't know, my lover, said Sazuje, hugging much Naruto and kissing him to fell the sadness in his body fluids. Naruto tears were entering Sasuke's mouth, who had his nostrils filled with green snot. The snots of Sasuke were so much in abundance that Naruto couldn't help but look at that pleasurable liquid of nausea inducing rottenness. Oh, I'm so glad she's not reading this. Banna, who was at the bed of the tent, saw Naruto and Sasuke making out and crying for his unlucky. Banna ride too because it's hard to find friends that support you in difficult times. Days went and go and Banna got wusser. If only he could turn into Hulk. A ninja he turned and many abilities got. But the one he most wanted is the one that will kill him. Self-control. One day, the last day of Bruce Banner, Sakura appeared again, but she was different. She turned into a bitch. Her he breast got extracted because of infections and various veins popping all over her body. She turned into a monster, a former self of what she was in the past. Oil dripped from her neck. Tentacles extruded from her ass. Lots of small penises penetrated her thousands and thousands of self and inflicted vagina, vaginal hole she created on her flesh with spatulas and cheese. What? Okay. Sa uh, Sasuke -er Naruto shouted in perfectly fried lung the now Sakura bitch wanting her revenge and kill her once she was in love. Sasuke. Sasuke and Naruto got out of their tent of love to see what was ah cried the two queer faced ninjas pissing their pantses and pooping pop pop popsies from their corny asses. Sakura approached the two hugging coward boys and threatened them with a Swiss cheese made of poisonous fermented cum. You I will kill you for what you have done to me. Look, no more bobbies. My vagina turned into comic noodles. And my heart, oh my heart made of cotton dandy. And Sakura threw polish equipment at the boys, hurting them with her bad intentions. They screamed and asked for help. No one came. But Bana, he was hearing. Yes, he got furious because of about all that stuff happening at his front door. A girl abusing against two best lovers. Two boys that just wanted to share the intimacy of love that everyone deserves in the heart. Just about at last one take me in the life or else no one would get happy if stay alone. Grr, Hulk is emerging. The fury finally got abused. Bruce. He will help and save his best friends, the boys he voyeurously watched making sex every night while he got sickened and sicker because of his self-acquired cancerous tumour. Hulk! Smash! And Hulk awakens. He immediately gets out of the tent and punches Sakuta in the face, launching her in the air thousands of kilometres. What? Ask confute the girl, not knowing what hit her. Hulk jumps to the heaven to catch the now flying girl and punch him more. Hulk! cries the green and rumus massive ninja throwing gamma shrukins against Sakura while she is flying in the stratosphere. You will not hit me, Hulk. I have power of love. And Sakura kisses every shrukin thrown against her, making them fall in love. Now my metal flying pets, cried Sakura to her shuriken slaves. Go kill this fake Japanese ninja. And the gamma shurikens obey. They fly towards Hulk. 
that is coming upwards to kill Sa Sakura. No. Hulk will defy the laws of love and show that angriness in the heart solve most of earthly troubles. And fastly like the spade of cannabis smoking dolphins, Hulk moves every shurikens with his tenuously oversized green tinted cock. Like a Haley Comet, or Comet, Sakura and Hulk is flying to towards the outer space. Sakura is feeling a bit lots of nervousness because she is going to be fucked up if she can't return in no time to Earth. She cannot breathe in space. Hulk will show you how not to treat Hulk's friends. Arg cries Hulk, threatening the ugly lady. Think, Sakura, think. My oxygen supply in the lungs is getting expelled through my pores. I will not stand much longer. And Sakura cries sorrowness a little bit, thinking about death. It's when Sakura looks to the sky and sees an angel. It's the International Space Station. Thank Buddha, I can refuel my oxygen supply. Sakura then uses her anal tentacles, the tentacles tie Hulk, giving her time to enter the space station. There, a Russian and two Americans greet her. How am I, a visitor? How did you reach here? asked the tree astronaut. Oh, it's a story long. Could you please spare oxygen? I'm blowing up. Oh, logically. And they gave, or give. Now Sakura have a new supply, but Hulk is unhappy, and with much strong he rips and shreds Sakura anal tentacles. Ah, she grames as blood bleed and boil as it get out of her body. You will pay green man of giant cock, and Sakura, reuniting her most inner structure and passion, uses a giant piece of cum chase and bam, a giant blow to the head of Hulk. The green emerald is kicked back into the earth atmosphere and Sakura goes behind him. While the two battlers are falling into the atmosphere, a vicious battle is occurring between them. Sakura punches and cuts Hulk's skin and Hulk punches and crushes Sakura's bones, making her virtually unrecognizable. You f idiot f screams Sakura, already without teeth or in fact intact face bones. The bleeding is excruciating. Can't you see f I'm f am f the f who f Hulk's ears get wet with that revelation. Is she the hero? How? Naruto and Sasuke destroyed my boob job. I came for babe payback and you're destroying me life screams sakura to hulk's brain with her tele telepathy no what have i done and hulk land on his feet finally to the ground and stop sakura lands this next moment and she grabs hulk and she grabs hulk giant lawnmower legs of cabbage juice hulk say sakura with telepathy because she have no teeth no more help me accomplish my destiny clean my honor for me Hulk now understands. He and Sakura enter the tent where he was dying and where Naruto and Sasuke were living too. As they enter, they, they are catch Sasuke and Naruto making butt sex. Hulk is displeased. No! Now Hulk understands. Naruto and Sasuke only trained he so he could destroy Sakura for them and they leave their gay lives together. But Sasuke doesn't respect Sakura woman needs. Even a gay couple can afford having a girl concubine. They could ha live a threesome. But no, Sasuke and Naruto all immerse into their own navels, got infatuated and displeased their women friend and destroyed her woman organ of nurturing, of nurturing the titties. As Hulk and Sakura enter, the two all covered in blood cuts and bruises, Naruto and Sasuke get up naked, very scared to what will happen. Don't kill us in Naruto. I will not kill, say Hulk. I will just punish your bad deeds. 
Shadow Clone Jitsu and Bam Hulk creates four copies of himself. Now my gay clones, fuck these bastards till their ass get flooded with green gamma cum and the gay gamma Hulk clones do as the original wishes. Two Hulks get Naruto and the other two get Sasuke, one for the butt, the other for the mouth. They are very strong and fast so the cum doesn't take long to come. As the Hulks come inside Naruto and Sasuke, filling then with Gamma Cum, the original Hulk says to Sakura, Do you want to celebrate this victory in your life of accomplished women master of chase? Yes, eat me my green tomato and Hulk and Sakura, Sakura make sex together while watching Naruto and Sasuke being violated by massive juggernauts of cock pleasure. The end. Well then... The next fic is one where the Powerpuff Girls fight a masturbating son. The masturbating son. Oh my word. Well, let's just get this over with. I do believe this is like the first... Powerpuff Girls fan fiction that will ever be reviewed by the fanfic critic, I suppose. So, um, let's take a look at it. The fanfic is called Naked Heart in Soul of the Sun by yours truly. Let's get this over with. The author. Hi, Peel Pay. Saw another story here, this time the Powerpuff Girl Kse. I always loved then. Maybe the best Cartoon Network show. Sad that it is cancelled, isn't it? This is so true, is the darkest I did till this day. Please don't condemn me. I just wanted to test new kinds of stories. Okay. And I think next week I'll publish something very different. I was thinking about an horror story or something like that. What do you think? Let me see how that unfolds. Enjoy. Naked Heart in the Soul of the Sun. Blossom was flying in the air, smelling the marmalade sky of their Townsville skies. Her sisters were flying along her over the city. Shoveling maelstrom pleasant kisses to pitifully sad birds. Blossom uttered the blonde, blondy, blonde, growled bumbles. What is it, dear pleasantry sister? Oh, I have constipation. Oh, sister, come to my blossom. I'll cover you with love. And Blubbles goes and hugs the little red-headed horny girl. Buttercup wasn't comfortable with that situation. She don't like transference of love to the hearts of unhappy couples. She is a lonely. She has a dark heart of destruction, and it's doomed to plummet down to the skies of unholy lactation. As the girls flew into the heavens, Blossom hugged Bubbles, and they got wet. Buttercup them couldn't have it anymore. She shouts, Nopes! You can't touch yourself without my approval condolences. And she punches heavily in the face, booble in the air, who flies like a lightning stairs in, and formida to the outer space, screaming like a raped middle-aged Wapanese kangaroo. God, mamid, booger cup, you took my love away from my bully breasts, and sent her astray to the final doom of the vacuum innocent vacuum filled innocent space. And Buttercup felt the pain. The pain that rages in the hearts of warriors, of milk dressed Amazons. That cannot be right. She must do something. It's her sister. The only pilgrim that lasts from Doctor Omtium promise Utopia. After the Professor Utonium got dead, the girls went to down here slope of self-fish behavior and utter destructive massacres. That's unfair. To halt Blossom when her father did himself. Mojo Mojo was his antagonist. The one that took his life. 
Without a unique blood of mercy in his bones, Eutonium's last words to his daughter was, My dears, please never touch other girls' vaginal fluid. You can get Ebola, and he died. This event was so dramatic to Blossom that she killed Mojo Jojo with her teeth, and he exploded a thousand of banana shells. Or got worse, Buttercup turned emo and cut her waists. Bubbles got genital herpes through contact of deceased roadkill pussies. And Blossom, El Blossom, she never recovered from that disgrace. But she maintained a more or less faithful position for her ideals. But she turned into an empty, an empty shield of what she was. Buttercup was now thinking about what to do when Blossom gave's idea. Buttercup, we must go after her. And Buttercup agrees. It's a good plan. So they follow Booble's blue trail of love to outer space. They went fast, passing through Jupiter, Mars, Venus, then Saturn. When the, set, when the trail was not more present, but the cup looked next near planet Mercury and said, Blossom, she could have fallen on that one. No, it is not possible. And Buttercup got sad. It was cold there, because it was far from the sun. No, wait. If they're talking about Mercury, Mercury is the closest planet to the sun. This person needs to learn their plans better. It was cold there, because it was far from the sun. Sheets of ice were forming on her clothes and frosting the leaking milt from her lactating titties. Buttercup, said Blossom. I know where Bubbles went. Yeah. Where? To the future. How? When you punched her, she flew to the space. She then acquired speed, passing on the tangent of the planet, acquiring acceleration from the gravitational speed. This caused her to go over the spit of light, and she transported to the future. Oh no! What have I done? And Buttercup emo suicidal tendencies took over her platinum soul, suffocating her new will to alive one more day. She goes sad and picked a screwdriver and then punctured her belly with it, perforating the stomach, the kidneys, and the bowels. Blood sprayed on the space and tears flowed from her sub subpunus bitter eyes. My sister, no, cries Loud Blossom, who totally, who got totally terrified by that unravel of self torment. Buttercup. I will not let you die, and Blossom caught Buttercup with her soldiers and flew towards the sun. They went their direction, and it got hater and hater. The fireballs from King Star Sun got thrown at the girls, but Blossom avoid. Sahi got near and near, and their clothes started to burn. Fire and lust emerged from their skins, and the foreskin of Sun got a boner. Sun looked to their eyes and said, You we shall not pass. And the Brucey Buttercup cried as their magnificent can't for Solar Star got angry at them. But Blossom was a hard one, so she fights against the supernova waves of high level X ray lust radiation. Nope, girls, you will die, cries the sun with a thunderous voice of castrated deer rapists. Sun put his hand at his junk and started to masturbate. The girls got near. They must avoid the fiery lava cum shot. Sun gets next to climax. The fluid core of the sun produces more and more pleasantly agony filled addicted sperm. Yes. He goes. He is going. My god. No! The sun spurts a gigantic full mass of destructive plasmoidic vernal diseases contained with the most dangerous species of moss and hornyful bacteria. That brine sonic storm of fiery liquid semen unleashes his sun aids to the most mainly comets and asteroids of the solar system, breaking the hymens of the very reality of the very reality itself. Time and space starts to dissolve and ejaculate. 
No. Cries Blossom with a flirtative, desperated pain as she feels and sees the universe as we know it turning into a self-folded Tampax origami of saccharose. Yes, Power Pud Girls uttered the moist song. I shall dominate the seven laws of physics. Physics no more. I will have to be slave to bed till you sexual devances. Mwahaha. And the sun opens its carnerious mouth to eat the heroic girls that fought for justice. Blossom, still with Buttercup on her shoulders, starts to flew to the opposite direction of the sun to escape its mouth bread of prognosis. But it's hard to get away. The reality is collapsing, and she must avoid colliding with the self-interlacing plans of dimension and other parallel existence. The sun comes near and near every second. Buttercup weight is just too much, and she knows it. Blue sun moans Boyer Cup with a frail voice as her bowels hang out of her scarred and drilled stomach. You must... Let go of me, or else we both die. No, I cannot let you die here. You're my sister. We together must save Bibles. No, you must save her. I shall die here, because all this is my faultness, my emphilic tendencies condemned all the galaxy. So long, sister, and Buttercup let go of Blossom cares of full care. She is starting to fall, getting pulled by the gravitational field of the sun. Blossom screams, but her voice can't be heard. It just evaporates before reaching the ears of the falling green clothes clad girl. Buttercup clothes are burning as she gets nude with the temperature. All the sheets of ice that were covering her skin are now gone. With the hate and her boobies now expel dozens of pounds of boiling bloated milk. She la sun laughs with his open mouth. The sun doesn't care. He molds the reality at his pleasure. He just can't stand the love between sisters. Blue summer's eyes got teary. Her sister body is engulfed by the maddening flames of hate at the core of our Till this moment, most beloved, light down a benefactor. The sun swallows the dying girl, and she is no more to be seen. Buttercup! No! Cries with lungs almost exploding the blossom girl. She can't believe this exorcism. First, her father. Then, Bubbles. And now, Q. She is alone. In the middle of space-time collapse, no one can help her. No one is at her side. So far, she managed to be the stoic girl fighting against the sadness and decay of mind and soul her sisters had fallen. The only thing that managed to not let her lose her mind was her own family. But now, it's gone. She is lone. Son is at his most apex. He looks to blue soon some few light years from his position, and brags, Ha! You girl is puny. Ks on on. You think you can fight me? No. You can't. You are just a jealous piece of immature, unsexed pussycat. Go away and live the rest of your existence in a bottom line retar retardant asteroid. I let you live. I let because I am God. Blues and crying tears are exploding with fear, with uncertainty. She doesn't know what to do, without a friend, without reason. But the rage took her body all of a sudden. She remembered her parents, her parents, her sisters, even the enemies that the life she took away in a moment of uncontrollable rageness. The memories that all that remains. And she must fight for them, because it's all that's left. Sun, the utter discrepitious, flaccid abhorrence, the red-horned missy child. You 
never be pardoned. And she flies in his directions with coconuts in her belly, urging for a blood, urging for the retaliation she's sworn to avenge. Comes on, I'll put you in a fetus filled black hole graveyard, you floozy wench. And Sun clenches his fists and races towards the illumination of that humanely pitiful threat. But Blossom is not a minimal threat. She is a girl. As Blossom approaches the sun's coroner, her senses start to fade. First her eyes melt in a peaceful, sad corridor, but she doesn't care. Them, her hearing feeling is expurgated from her carnal vessel, but it's useless. She doesn't need it anymore. Not to where she is going. Then, her tongue unleashes blood from its papillae, turning the battle of her life into a sour memento of the universal destruction unfolding before her lovely mute skin. Quit it, sultry girl. Telepathically transmits the sun to his antagonist. You are dead. Go away, and I'll let you live. In a disableful way, ha ha ha, mutters with brains full utterness the self unco unconscious son. Blossom doesn't care anymore. With the last energies that last her in her body, she is miles away from the sun, her skin turned into roasted eyebrow coal, and her bones are collapsing in a dust of cadaveric pulsa. But the energy of love for the humanity permits the continuation of her quest. Blossom, without her senses, nor her touch feeling nor her carnal sensory senses doesn't know where to go, but she lets the passion guide her. Guides her, the passion for a better world. Sun is only a mile away. Her hair is catching fire, and fumes are exhaling from her internal organs. Her teeth exploded into thousandfold pieces of bloody dust, and her heart only beats for a miracle of love. She have only one chances, only one. Love guides. It tells her where to go. To the dick, to the dick, to the dick. And she enters. Blossom infiltrates the sun's engorged Aruthia, and he is totally consterned with abomination. No, she cannot do it. And the, stun, and the sun starts to masturbate furiously again to extricate Blossom from his precious solar dong. The red-hot steaming blobs of reality warping semen are ejaculating from the sun's ball sacks, and as they pass through the erythora, the very last pieces of flesh and mortal cells dwelling over Blossom's body get stripped away from reality to a void of time-space continuum, but Blossom's heart is stronger, and even without a mortal vessel to carry on, it continues on its journey to the center of the testicle. No, this cannot be. You can't rape the penis of a god. But Blossom already did it. Her last remaining piece of flesh, her heart, reaches the center of the sun's semen generating gullet. It is filled with star destroying pulsars and dwarf stars, slaving to maintain the circle of jerk that permits the sun to control the very fabric of reality itself. Blossom's heart goes to the center, the very center where the minuscule galaxy made of erotic homogeneous black holes is. She approaches it, and she senses the hate of the solar system's sun, all of his hatred against humanity, all the false gods praised and loved in place of him. The justifications of his acts are embedded inside this shiny piece of black emotions that composes his very soul. Ra, Amatasu, Apollo, Helios, Soul and all the false gods whom the humanity's crimes against nature were committed. She now knows why he did this, but she can't forgive. He have no right over anyone. He must not continue his quest to destroy everything. He must be stopped. No, please, I beg forgiveness. Don't put an end to the reign of Calca Nerva I'm putting to the generations of man. You must let me life. But Blossom doesn't want to forgive. She must stop 
him. She is failing. The horse is stopping. One more breath, one more. Her heart accumulates the only left power to it. The heart knows this must be done. Blossom's heart enters the black hole gonad. It pulsates. The black hole mounts and boom. A supernova of sacred savage semen explodes inside the ball sack of the sun. He screams, but the obliteration is total. The cum spreads all over the galaxy, the universe. All the reality gets bowl caked in the face by the explosion of fruitful penis juice caused by one thing. The love for the others. The love of Blossom. Sun evaporates in a flood of cosmetic seminal gust. The spores and time starts to back to its place. The realities are turning to normal. And one person appears again in the right place. Bubbles comes back from the void of non-existence. She saw everything. The fight. Buttercup dead. Blossom sacrifice. She just thinks, What have I done to my life? Blossom. And Buttercup. You. Showed me. In Bubbles cries as the universe turns to a state of normalcy. But there is no more sun. No more earth. The solar system is gone. And her sisters. Bubbles is the last remnant of an era. The last human alive in the middle of a pool of cum flavored universe. And her constipation continues. The end. This last fic is... Well, it's Comics Nix's worst. It even disturbs me quite a bit, as it's based on a video game I like. It involves a camp full of psychic ten-year-olds going to Saddam Hussein's sex slave-filled brain and... Well, just to read it. Well, it appears that he's freaked out by this fanfic as well. Well, he says it's the last fanfic. So, let's take a look at it. We're almost done. And like I said before, I'm so glad that she didn't read this. My word. Let's get started. The final fanfic we'll be taking a look at today is called Love, The Fuel of Heroes by Comics Nix. Let's get started. Hi people, long time no see. I'm not posting fan fiction so regularly because of the college, but don't afraid, I'll not stop. This one here was requested by Endangered Monkey. Thanks for your support, Endangered Monkey, and I'm sorry for the immense delay. I hope you enjoy, and the other readers too. Enjoy. Love, the fuel of heroes, the whispering rocks, psychic summer camp was only the beginning. After graduating the summer school, there is only one more step towards the transformation into oneself to turn to a psychonaut. Yes, students. Shout Morsu Landre. You graduated, but now the next step is going to be more difficult. To be a real psychonaut, you must accept the final probation. The last challenge against the most putrid and twisted mind in the whole world. The, the most twisted mind professor. Who is that? Asks Bojan Bulin. Very, very utterly scared. He don't like scary. Oh. Who you ask? You will see. You will see. Ar har 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 har. And Mercu goes back to his cabin laughing maniacally to prepare the one whose mind is the ultimate battlefield against mental morality in the metal summer camp. In this meantime, the students await at a large room filled with benches where everyone is seated, awaiting the return of all Olindre. Raz is by the side of Lily, so much feeling in his heart but that lady is so close to herself. Why don't she open her feelings some more? Why don't she freeze the dam of passion and embraces the coffee-like love she mostly hides from the young rat Sputin? The hair of the psycho knots. Lily, uttered rat Sputin. I'm scared. 
kiss me. And Raz immediately grabs Lily Zanotto and tries to force a kiss. Fuck. And Lily mine punches Raz scorch bag. Squirrel. bad. Some cum gets out of his little penis and taint Raz leather pants. Everyone laughs. Ah. Raz come to enjoy what a pervert cries in mostly satisfaction. The yellow teeth Bobby Zilch. He likes it so much that unknowingly to himself, he punches Chloe Barge on the helmet, breaking the helmet glass and scarring her face for life. She is not pleased. What do you think you're doing? asks Lily. I'm a girl of principles. Sorry, Lily, mutter in disgrace Raz, so ashamed in his own calm. I thought girls liked bad boys. Lily frowned her skin and closed her mouth. Hate filled the little heart of that so lonely princess of grey matter. Raz, looking deeply into the skin folds of her new aged look, aged neck, knew the pain he inflicted into her femininity. He went to the bathroom and cut his wrists. After a afternoon awaiting Mercure to come back, everyone was hungry. They were at the room with no food, no air conditioner, and no television. Only a small radio chair, then a bit, but soon the erotic soap opera bored their ears off. Most of the characters were interrupted by the same two guys, even the girls. Could it be the inexistent budget of the radio show, or is it a transsexual filled melodrama drama? No one knows. Lily, asked Chloe, the bleeding astronautist. Isn't Raz taking too long to come back? I don't fucking care. He could die, and I would never forgave his Emily cry. Tears of supine paramour infected her heart waves of love. She can't resist a boy's sabbatical self whoring. Even though his obnoxious attitude nauseated her to the point of causing pancreatic evacuation, he was cute. I will go for him. And she went. At the same time, Orlean come back with a brain in a jaw. Ah! Everyone shout in murder's fearf fearfulness. Orlando was bringing with him a living brain inside a glass walls jaw. It's disgustingly sexy. That's what Chloe thought. But she is now deformed. She lost her will to live. But the body continues, and the mind too. Okay, you bastards, shouted Morsu. The last probation, the ultra magnum opus of myself persona. This is a trophy I won when I was asked to find the most famous dictator of the Middle East. This is the brain of Saddam Hussein. Everyone fell off the chairs. Saddam Hussein, the most murderous murder man of men. And they must fight him. Good Lord, I'm out of here. And Bobby Zilch said goodbye to a life as a psychonaut. Everyone got back to their chairs. Lily, the most courageous and ambitious student of the place, is immersed in self-doubt. Shit got real. And she runs to through bathroom, seeking comfort from Raz, the man whom she despises so much, but now, in face of the utmost danger, she needs to fill that place in her heart that seeks a fine friend hand. Okay, students, shout Morsu, or Morsu, with a sarcastic grim and erect penis in his trousers. Enter the fucking brain, now. And the students that were still alive did as he wished. For first chops, then Clem, then Crystal, then Dojin, shouts Morsu. Why are you standing there? Enter the fucking brain, you son of a motherly wuss. Pro, pro, Professor, I can't. You can't. I'm going to kick your ass inside this fucking mine and cut your small penis if you don't obey my orders. But I have, I have, and Orlando, with much hatred and impatience, went and kicked Dojin's ass, but what the fuck? Shouts with unbelievability the Marisu, dear professor of the camp. You shit your pants, you asshole. That's what I was trying to say. And all 
Our Orlando's boats are now full of diarrhea. He can't believe such a disrespectful ass act against his seniority. There's only one place to correct this heresy. The bathroom. And he goes. Morsu Oranda opens the bathroom door and what he sees? What? Shout the man Orlando. Lily Zato, what the fuck? Why the fuck are you sucking Raz's dong? Lily caught with much surprise and bites Raz dick almost severing it. Ouch. That must have hurt. Raz, Professor, I I was saving his life. Orlando looks very in disbelief at the situation. Lily Zanotto, naked, with a dripping pussy, sucking the dick of an almost dead Raz, with a pool of blood all over them. Blood that gets ejaculated from the cut wrists of that poor porn psychonaut. Saving his life, you are raping this poor dying bomb. You are sentenced to death. And Orlando grabs Lily's arms and tries to take her out of the bathroom. Orlando is committing a great mistake. When Lily entered the bathroom seeking for Raz, she found him dying in a blood dying from a blood loss because of his cut wrists. So courageous she was, she thought fast, put her skirt down, got all naked and started to suck Rat Zupin's dick. It caused the poor Raz's dick to swell with blood, delaying his inevitable fate. But now, Orly Andre is watching Lily's plan to save Raz's life. Raz, shouts Lily, you must come, and she transmits a telepathic message to him. He understands. Oh, oh, okay. Answer the poor fucked up Raz. Lily is fighting her maximum to stay inside the bathroom because it will help the cum shot. Otherwise, the dick will wither and all be lost. Raz looks to Lily's pussy, that dripping, engorged blood, bloody pussy, and gets erect again. He is jerking. Jerking. No. Oleander caught Lily, and he is taking her out of the bathroom. Fast Raz, before the pussy is out of sight, he is coming, the pussy is going, but it's so near, but she's already out of the room. Come on. Oleander already took her out of the bathroom. Raz's dick cannot come without stimuli. He cries. No, cries and tears Lily as she hears Raz's last please, but she have the last stroke to deal. Raz, she shouts from outside. Oh, ho, 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 I'm orgasming. And she stimulates a very ultra-hot telesex phone hall. This immediately puts Raz on the alert, and he comes. The cum goes all over the place in a fountain of joy and promises of salvation. Raz looks for, looks all that for a moment. He is contemplating Lily's feet, the other love she gave for him. Now he have a confirmation of passion. He must save her. Raz then do as Lily said telepathically. He picks up the cums telekinetically, reunites it in a glob of mucus proportions, and puts it on his bleeding wrists. This stops the bleeding, and Raz is saved. Raz immediately gets up. I must save Lily. Oriana is probably going to confine her inside Saddam's brain and let the old dictator fuck her vagina. I must not let this happen and Raz kicks the bathroom door with rage of a thousand horny bulls. Time is against him. The only thing that remain that still remains is his unblooded body is the love carry and licked upon his manhood by the undecided lovely Lily. Raz looks around. No one in the room. No one is already inside Sunna's brain. I shall go for my love and he enters the mass of brain matter preserved into alcoholic beverages. Boom! And Raz entered. The sight is not good. Penis is everywhere. Fucking middle-aged vaginas with the force of a truck full of gonorrhea pancake. Suddenly, the penis has emerged from the bloody made of flesh walls and tries to force their way inside Raz's rectum. Damn you, ridiculous severed members of a murder. Shout Raz, who runs from the dicks that jump behind him, coming profanities and trying to fuck at all costs. Raz have no time to think. His virility is at stake. 
and he entered and he entered tunnels made of guts without knowing where he was going. The penises followed him. Their balls kicking on the ground made of shit and spraying the Melvin dung at Raz's back and butt. After some time running, Raz could escape. The dicks were nowhere to be seen. Ugh, oh, they're gone. But where am I? And Raz looks around. Whoa, look at this place. Well, it looks like a palace. Saddam Hussein's Iraq palace. Probably he is near the dictator's central command of consciousness. I guess I'll say for now. The brain is inside alcohol. Saddam must be so drunk he couldn't even know all the campers are here. But where could he poss where could possibly be Lily? Oleander said she would be killed. Damn. Think, Raz, think. Raz started to wander inside Sedan Sedan Palace. It was a nice palette with smells of roses, avocado liquors, and public lice. The ground was made of feminine butts that exhale cherry cake farts. I highly doubt his palace looked like that in reality. Mm -hmm. The songs made by those butts were very pleasant to the ear, and for some time Raz was lost in the middle of the panacea of woman flavour. Saddam, for sure, is a man of refined taste, agreed Raz. Raz actually started to feel weird. He doesn't know why, but the butt thoughts are really inducing him into a state of an extreme pleasurable to Paul. Oh man, how I want to sleep. Raz was very sleepy. He lay on the ground, searching, searched for a comfortable butt, reclined his head on it, and slept. I think you mean to say slept. Some time passed, and he couldn't wake. The scent was trapping him. How could he escape? Raz found himself dreaming. He was inside a bathroom, a bathroom, and he was bleeding. Wait, Lily is coming. She is sucking me. What a dream. Oh, it's good. Come on, baby. More, more. Uh, wait, I'm remembering. Lily saved me. I was dying. No, I'm dreaming. I need to wake up. I must save her. But what? I cannot. Damn, what's happening? I, I was in the butt room. Then I saw asses on the floor. It was good. Yeah. Oh, the scent. It's making me sleep. Damn, I must awake. Raz started to feel uneasy. If he continued like that, Saddam will rape Lily, and he will never ever make sex with a virgin pussy. It would be a disgrace. Okay, time for extreme emergency measures. Raz's subconscious then started to move inside his brain. He reached for the deencephalon. Ah, uh, I guess the medulia is near. Raz then entered the medulla and moved inside, going down inside his spinal cord. All right, almost at the cock CX. Raz then jumped some bones and finally reached his so dearly loved balls. Oh God, Raz, forgive me for doing this to you or myself. If a subconscious astral projection had have some respect in these lands. Raz is subconscious and prepared, aimed, and then punched a big kick on Raz's dormant balls, activating a excruciating pain all over the boy's fucked up genital punching bag. Ah! Screamed Raz, waking up with that supine demonstration of self love by his subconscious lovely self. God damn it, my balls. Shit, I must get out of here. And Raz run. Raz raced all over Sedan. Sprain, fighting against giant penises, fire-breathing vaginas, and engorged clips of old sitcom reruns. Finally, he reached the room, where everyone was. The final room, the most deeply conscious shithole of all Sadan's fecal brain. Raz looked around. All his friends being raped by Sadan's little penises. Gojin, Elka, Chloe, even Orlendry. Sadan Rasane is fucking everyone with his tiny monstrosities. Damn, I hope I'm not too late. Lily, my love. But then, from the shadows of blood and cancer, here comes Saddam Roussian. Saddam, screamed Raz, where did you put my darling paramour, Lily, the virgin? Saddam is not amused. His, he twists his mustache, spits on the ground, and picks a fresh vagina from the wall. To comb his hair, my dear Raz, uttered the Middle Eastern for, for her. 
You are so naive. Do you think I, the master of Kwai's sex, is going to lend you any one of my sexual slaves? Sexual slaves? You didn't, you know. I haven't touched Lily. She's just sleeping at my breast engorgement chamber. You know, she is flat-chested and in my kingdom. Women must have big bulge at the tits. Raz is disconcerted. He is practically powerless in front of this madman leader. All of his friends gagged, bound, and raped. Leading anus notwithstanding, they are not very useful at the combat arena. He cannot on then to fight such a powerful and extreme villain, such a disadvantaged, fucked situation. The army of brainless penises is now surrounding him, arming the cannons to, to shoot, to emasculate his genital pleasures for once and for all. No, Raz. Think. It here must be away. Ah ha 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 ha. Laughs maniacally the Fahur Hussein, jerking off at the wall of vulvas while he looks the last moments of our hero what's, a, what's putting Aquato, the beloved and utterly mainly psychonaut, the never bound a clean shaved vagina. Rusain then prepares to destroy the Repudson. My dear slave penises, load the cum, and they were loaded. Prepare. Fire. The thousand twelve inch penises shoot the acid flaming cum at the same time, and for Raz, it was like the world slowed down, the last moments of his life, and he never ever declared his mostly delightful and full of love affection for the lady of psychic maltis lactations, the dear and affected Lily Zanotto. He started to rehash and remember this day, what happened in all of it. He tried to grope Lily, the rejection of his sexual advantage, his cut wrists, then she sucking him, then she saving weight. That's it. Fast Raz, use fire against fire. Use your own cum to save your love from the claws of injustice. And Raz remember the cum on his wrist, the same used to, stand the, to stanch the bleeding. With the speed of mind, Raz telekinetically morphed the now clotted ball of semen on his wrist into a protection ball and circling all of his body. In a microsecond, the pain of slave slave's acid flaming cum hit the Raz semen shield and sprayed all over Saddam Hussein's most beloved memories. No, shouted Saddam Hussein, seeing his strategy backfire majestically and his own fuck juices boiling a life of orgianist mass murders and crimes against the poor oil wells. His memories, tainted by his own mind, come a liquefying in a dough of pure hatred and constipation. Saddam Hussein's mind bowel movements got compromised, and he pooped. His trousers got wet and stinky with that pappy moisture black anal vomit. He is finished. Yar screams with joy the replenished life with life Raz, but his happiness is not for long because Sadan brain is starting to break apart and it's going to blow. Shit, I must find Lily and Raz runs in a hurry with the heart between the legs, trying not to lose control of his Busted mind bladder. Lily, he screams. Lily. Raz. Yes, Lily is alive. And the breast augmentation machine finished its job. Raz find the room where Lily was at time to see her getting out of the machine. Raz got a boner. My gosh, Lily. Your breasts are fantastic. Can I touch them? No. Only after marriage. Fuck. Raz grabs Lily, uh, Lily's arm and starts to race to Saddam's, Saddam's brain exit. Raz, wait. Any others? Sorry, Lily. We have no time. Maybe next time. Raz and Lily find the exit and blam. They get out at the last minute. They run far away. Through fast they can. After a second, Saddam's brain goes boom. Exploding in a thousand of bloody cerebral brawl paces. And the whispering rock psychic summer camp is now only a sad memory of a past of old Baruchini bureaucratic bureaucratic I'm sorry coaches and self absorbed and in, inefficient teachers. Oh Raz, say a sad Lily. Everyone died. What will be of us and the camp? Lily say Raz, grabbing Lily's hands and looking directly into Emerald Eyes of Passion. We are alive. We must do justice to the good name of this deceased camp. Our good friends and old Mercio Olander. 
We will maintain alive the memory of our precious psychonauts training camp. Raz then kissed Lily in the lips. Oh, so honey flavored lips of cocoa butter. And they immerse themselves into a sea of love and hope for a new future. A future that no one can taint. There is a lot of work to do. But now, they are only for themselves. The end. Epilogue. Despite the total destruction of the Whispering Rock sum Psychic Summer Camp, Raz and Lily worked hard to maintain the spirit of the place and those who died in vain. And so, after ten years of hard work, Raz and Lily created the Whispering Rock Psychic Summer Fast Food Delight, a chain of fast food restaurant that serves the best burgers this side of the Pacific. Raz is the president and general manager. Lily is the vice president and head of treasury. Oh, and not everyone died in that horrible explosion. Sasha Nin, that was at vacation at the time, got unemployed with the camp destruction, so Raz gave him a job at the restaurant. He is the fry cook. And, Mil and Mila Vodello, that was unemployed too and had to sell her body to pay the bills, she got a job too. She take care of cleaning and sanitation in the restaurant bathrooms. And everyone is happy. The end. Well, Susan, it appears that you have ended the challenge. How are you feeling? Oh, if you're wondering how I'm feeling, I'm actually I'm quite fine. You're not insane? Not at all. I don't understand. You see, there's a big difference between myself and the fanfic critic. She went insane because of reading bad fanfics, but the thing is with me, bad fanfics, they do drive me bonkers, but I don't let them get to me as much as they get to her. So, no matter how bad of a fanfic you show me, I will probably never go insane because of it. You insignificant insect. Do you really think you can get away with defying me? You have messed with me for the last time. It's been a pleasure, Susan.
Have no fear, my child. I am here to make everything better. Who are you? Who am I? I am Lesbian Jesus. <laughs> As being Jesus? That is correct, my child. Huh. The fanfic critic. Ah, oh, the poor dear has died yet again. I had to bring her back before. Took a few tries, but I did manage him. So tell me, my darling, how did she get in this state? She was possessed. I... That... He came out of the computer and he, he possessed her and... I tried knocking, knocking her out with the, the, with the pistol. It didn't do any good, and he kept on coming at me. I saw the gun, and I just picked it up, and I, I didn't mean to kill. I didn't mean to kill her. Shh, 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 shh. It's okay. It's okay. It's a simple fix. I will heal her and bring her back to life. Just watch. There. Now she is alive again. All I did was heal her wound and restore her life. She will be a bit weak, though, for the next couple days. Still feel a bit of pain from when she was, um, killed. But other than that, she is alive and well. I don't know what to say. Don't say anything at all. I will do anything for you, my dove. I am... Um... I think I should mention that I've always had a thing for twins. What? But I think I've overstayed my welcome long enough. If you ever need me, my dear Susan, just call my name and I'll be there. Okay, I can kind of understand you taking off my jacket when you decide to play the role of fanfic critic, but you do really need to take off the shirt. I'm afraid the shirt is ruined, and I had to remove it because it was ruined, and I had to throw it away, because there's no fixing it. Do, did the Comic Snakes Challenge review have anything to do with the shirt getting ruined? You can say that the review had something to do with it, in a sense. Okay, do you mind telling me what happened? It's a bit complicated to explain. You might as well tell me, Sue. I don't care how long the story is. I just want to know. Right. 
well, after I knocked you out with a face pistol. Ringmaster J5 wasn't particularly happy that I knocked you out. However, he went on with the challenge and was going to have me do it instead of you, seeing there was no way you could do it. So, um, after I moved you, moved you over by the ladder there, I got started with the challenge. Read the fanfic, he did his usual spew, spiel or whatever. Read the next one, it was tedious, the fanfics were stupid, some of them were so bad I was laughing. And by the end of it, he wanted to see how my sanity was. And he was unpleasantly surprised when I showed him that I was still indeed the same as I was prior. And that I was not affected at all by the bad fanfics. The next thing I know, I'm sent flying back up against the bed right there. And um, I look over where you were and you're glaring at me with pure hatred. When you, when you go to speak to me, his voice comes out. And I know, I knew at that very moment that he possessed you. He lunged at me and I managed to dodge him. I grabbed my face pistol from the desk, made sure it was on stun, fired it up and shot him. He went flying back, seeming to be unconscious, so I approached him, bound him, and he lashed out at me. He almost, he almost got me, but I managed to dodge just quick enough so he wasn't able to slit my throat. Yes, he, he, you had the fa you had the razor in your persons, and he, guess I, guess he knew about it somehow. And he started to lunge at me again. I crawled over to that corner right there, and I was cornered. He was approaching slow and menacingly, grinning evilly, ready to kill. I looked around for anything I could use, and I, I saw the gun. The gun that you had bought for the cupcakes review, it was right there. Without even thinking, I, I reached for it, you know. Survival was on my mind. Hate was getting closer. The, the razor was open. I took, I took the gun and I pointed it right at your chest. I, I pulled the trigger. I pulled the trigger. I watched the look of shock upon your face. I watched as you fell to the ground. It was like slow motion, you know? After a moment, I stared at the gun, I threw it to the ground in disbelief, and I, I went over to you. If it wasn't for the blood stain on your shirt, I would think you were sleeping because of how peaceful you looked. I reached for your neck for a pulse, and I didn't feel one. And I began to panic. I mean, yes, I know that could have brought me back with the Dragon Balls, but the Dragon Balls have not been charged yet. And even if they were charged, we don't have them. Who knows how long it'd take for us to get them. I just, I, I didn't know what to do. And then there was a bright light in the room. The next thing I know, there's some weird woman standing right there. This white robe, long flowing brown hair. She called herself Lesbian Jesus. She may have mentioned that she brought you back to life before. And, I don't know, I think she has a thing for you or something. It doesn't make sense, lesbian Jesus, after all, but she brought you back to life. She um, healed the area where you were shot. I mean, you're still going to be sore and weak from what happened from being shot with the face pistol and with the gunshot. But other than that, you know, she healed the wound enough where you could live. 
and then she left. And um, that's what happened. I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. Susan. It's okay. I'm so sorry. Susan, come on. Look at me. Look at me. You did what you needed to do. Okay, don't doubt that for a second. You did what you needed to do. If you didn't shoot me, you'd be dead right now. And that idiot, that crazy idiot would be running around in my body wreaking havoc on who knows. On who knows. On anyone. You did what you needed to do. I'm glad that you killed me because if you hadn't, who knows what would have happened. It'll be okay, Susan. I know that you feel horrible right now, but you will get over this. You did the right thing, and I'm not mad at you for doing it. You did the right thing. Don't doubt that for a second. You need to forgive yourself, Susan. <laughs> I don't know if I can forgive myself a lot of you. I don't know if I can. You can. I know you can. Look, I know that you feel horrible about what you did to me, but you need to understand that I'm not mad at you at all for what you did. In fact, I'm very glad that you killed me, because if you hadn't killed me, you'd be dead, and Ringmaster J5 would be running loose, wreaking havoc on the internet. I don't want that, and you don't want that. You did the right thing, Susan, and you need to forgive yourself for what you did. You keep on saying that I should forgive myself for killing you, but why can't you forgive yourself for killing me? It's different with me, Susan. Doesn't matter, we both... I killed you. The big difference between what you did to me and what I did to you is that I murdered you. When you killed me, it was self-defense. I was going to kill you if you didn't do anything. It was self-defense. What I did, on the other hand, I wasn't defending myself. It wasn't like you were running around being evil. No. You were an innocent. And I purposely murdered you. That's why I can't forgive myself for what I did to you. But I know that you can forgive yourself for killing me. Because it was the right thing to do. If you hadn't done it, you wouldn't be sitting here right now talking to me at this moment. I need you to forgive yourself, Susan. Please, forgive yourself. Fine, then. I'll try to, for your sake. Are you going to be okay? I'll be okay. You should probably get some rest, go to bed. You're still weak from what happened. Alright. Good night, Susan. Right? Good night. work. Work was work. Well, um, I, uh, went shopping today and I got something for you. You have something for me? Yes, I, uh, got you a new shirt for your web show. Oh, thanks, Sue. I mean, I, you didn't have to do that. Well, I figured I owed it to you. I mean, yeah, the shirt kind of got ruined because I had, um... 
because I, I killed you. You didn't have a choice. You did the right thing, okay? Well, then why don't you go and um, try that shit on, see how it fits. Okay, um, just uh, wait in your room and I'll show you when it's on, okay? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll go wait in my room. My hat's in the spots. So, um, what do you think? Nice. Yeah, I think it's um, a lot better than the old shirt. I will admit that shirt wasn't exactly um, flattering. That's why I never really wore it around the house. And um, had it for who knows how long, you know. But I, I, I think this, I think this will work. Um, thanks, Sue. Are you sure you're going to be okay? I'll be fine. Okay. Remember, you did what you had to do. You did the right thing. And you can't keep on beating yourself up over it. I keep on telling you to do the same thing. I have told you before why I can't forgive myself. Look, I have forgiven you. And that should be all that matters. I mean, I don't care that you killed me. Even if I remembered, I probably wouldn't care. You'd be singing a different tune if you remembered. I promise you that. Well, um, I'm gonna go cook us some dinner, okay? Uh, call you down when it's done. I don't know if you can hear me. Mom, Miss um, Lesbian Jesus, but I would kind of like you to show yourself right now. Oh, hello, Susan. It's such a pleasure to see you again. Tell me, my dear, why have you summoned me here to your presence, which I am so humbled to be at? I need you to um, do me another favor, if you don't mind. Anything for you, my darling. I want my memories back. Thank you.